I love, <clears throat> stop. <laughs> love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of our effort. While we can try to be joyful, what happens when circumstances don't prompt it? <laughs> the fruit of the Holy Spirit brings about, in the most shocking of times, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. So really, it's not a matter of even how much of the Holy Spirit you have. It's a matter of how much of you are you willing to give to the Holy Spirit? Who is going to rule? Because if it's simply left to us, I will naturally not respond in the most loving way all the time or the most joy-filled way when trial comes or kindness when people are mean. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit does something different. So really, it's a matter of who's in control. I learned this a lot in parenting. Who's in control? <laughs> or who is convinced that they're in control? Yes? In fact, on my littlest one, Jedediah, who we called Jedi, he was being a little bit disobedient in his behavior. <clears throat> and so I knew it was a matter of who was ruling, who was in control. Why wasn't he obeying me? I know what's best for him, right? And so we were driving and I had a little moment with him. I said, Jetty. He said, yes, mama. I said, who's the boss? Because he was disobeying me. Jetty, who's the boss? And he goes, you are mama but I still do what I want. <laughs> he said that. And I went, oh, and then I tried not to laugh. Do you ever have those moments where you're like, oh, Jetty. And he goes, I'm sorry, mama. I said, we're gonna try that again. Jetty, <clears throat> who's the boss? You are mama. And he smirks and he goes, but sometimes me. <laughs> this really happened two weeks ago. And isn't it so like us? Isn't it so like us? God, you're the boss, but I do what I want, right? But I act how I want. I'm sorry, God, you're the boss. I sit in this series, Holy Spirit, I want more of you, less of me. You're the one that's in control, and then the way that we act, like sometimes me. <laughs> Anyone else? Can you relate to my four-year-old who said it far better than I ever could? Now, the truth is, I don't want to look at my little four-year-old in light of what I've been even preparing for this week as we focus on joy. I don't want to look at him and just say, be the, fruit, be the fruit. I don't want to just look at him and tell him to act a certain way. What I want to do is cultivate his little heart. And this is a different way for me to parent. Because in moments when he's not performing and making me look good in a social setting, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's not about that. It's not about that. My temptation is to look at him and go with a smile. You know the smile that actually has the anger behind it? Be kind. Act kind. Can I tell you, I believe my role as a parent is not to make him perform either. It's to open up his little heart to all, maybe all the reasons that he's not. And maybe all the little ways that he can surrender over his pain or surrender over his frustrations so that the Holy Spirit could actually cultivate something that's gonna be far more powerful than just a moment of acting kind. And that's what he wants to do in us this morning. And I wonder, as you're, you've been sitting in this series, which I do love this series, the nine traits of the Holy Spirit's powerful work in our lives. It's basically a continuation of our last series, bringing heaven down. What does it look like? It looks a whole lot more like the Holy Spirit ruling our lives than us feeling the pressure to be the boss. You know what the fruit of us being the boss is? Anxiety. Because we're trying to carry the weight of responsibility of controlling life. Good luck, right? The Holy Spirit wants to be the one in control because the things he produced love, joy, 
peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I wonder though, I wanna go to prayer before we open up his word to hear from him. I wonder where you're at this morning because if you haven't noticed, that's where God's gonna meet you. I say it over and over and over again. He's not gonna meet you where you're not. He's gonna meet you right where you're at. So let's start there. But specifically as we go to prayer, I want you to think honestly, do you feel close to God right now? Or does he feel distant? And I'm gonna tell you, there's not a right or wrong answer. There's just the truth. And that's where we can bring our heart to him. And let's see what he does. That's our starting point. I'm so expectant for this morning service. Are you? <laughs> Open up your heart. Because the truth is, I can't convince you to be more kind, but that's the work I'm confident the Holy Spirit's doing in us as we open our hearts to him, so let's do just that. Heavenly Father, here we are. I pray that every person in this room would share their heart with you. God, you feel distant, or God, you feel close, or God, I feel angry, or God, I feel hurt. Would you just put it into a sentence to God who already knows he's not surprised by it, but he wants to be present to you in it. Cultivate your fruit as we submit our lives, we pray. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Galatians chapter five, beginning in verse 22, we read this. But the fruit of the Spirit is, pay attention to that word right there, is, Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, that portion of us that wants to rule and reign, the flesh. This is already true. In scripture, you'll read a lot that is already true and not yet fully realized. This is an already true. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh which, with its passions and desires. Since we, again, another already, live by the Spirit, now here's the not yet, the invitation, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I told you to pay attention to the word is, and here's why. Because it doesn't say the word are. And this is significant when you're studying the fruit of the spirit, because if I were to ask you how many fruit are there? I remember learning as a little kid, there's nine, right? The fruit of the spirit is, pay attention, if I were to say, Megan is happy, singular. Megan and you and her are happy. What's the difference? The word is tells you how many. R tells you two or more. How many fruit are there? The fruit is, which tells us this. You don't just struggle with patience. You struggle with submitting to the fruit of the Spirit. You don't just struggle with joy. You're struggling with love, peace, patience, self-control, kindness. Here's what it is. They rise and they fall together. Some of us want to pick and choose. I want joy, but I don't want to act loving. <laughs> I just read your diary. <laughs> they rise and fall together, which really means that the level of our spiritual maturity, if you want to find it, it's actually probably at your weakest trait. <laughs> because the truth is we can act joyful but it's the supernatural combination of all of the traits that represent the one fruit of what the Holy Spirit wants to produce out of your life. So really it's a submission issue, not an acting issue. It's not about behaving right, it's about submitting all because they rise and they fall. So I first wanna talk about where the fruit, singular, is, 
Then we'll talk about this week specifically, which is joy and what that is before getting to how in the world we can overflow the fruit. So first, where is it? Verse 22, remember, it's the fruit of the Spirit. So where's the fruit of the Spirit? Well, thankfully, we learned this little song, some of us, when we were younger. And if so, I'm gonna invite you at all the campuses, including this one, to sing along with me. I've got the joy, 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 joy. Where? Wait, where? I've got the, okay, stop. It was painful, it was painful, because you guys didn't do it in a joyful way. It was like, I've got the, it was just, it didn't work, it didn't work. So where is it? Some of you, so I just went, down in my heart to stay, and I'm so happy. Okay. It's in the heart. Do you wanna know where joy, the fruit of the spirit is? It starts in the heart. Now let me give you a brief theological overview of our heart. So this is our heart. Now when we are born, we are born into sin, which means we are born without God's spirit dwelling within. So we have this hole in our heart. And so what we do as a young kid or basically all the way up until the moment that we choose to believe and put our faith and trust in Jesus, and not only do we, does he take our sin, we receive his life. Before that happens, you have all of these external ways that you attempt to fill the heart. Friendships, family, love, sports, um, golf. I mean, anything that we do, we try to fill this God-sized hole in our heart. And there's ramifications of it. And at times, things affect our heart in childhood, throughout our adulthood. And so we have all of this residue from our life that's happening within our heart. And no wonder it's such a mess. But then at some point in our life, you submit your life over to Jesus. You put your faith and trust, not in your ability to get to God, but you put your faith and trust in Jesus's not only ability, but his actual coming to you when you couldn't get to him, dying for you, taking your sin, anything that would keep you from him, and him rising to new life, being the first fruit of the resurrection so that one day we can rise too and death isn't the end of the story. So the minute you give your life over to Jesus, yeah, they clap for that. The minute you give your life over to Jesus, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to pray for all of this. Now it's not that suddenly we don't find joy from people. I find a lot of joy from good behavior from my kids. And Maria Kondo found a lot from cleaning out her closet. Remember that lady, the joy sparker lady? Does this spark joy if not toss it? problem is we begin to put a whole lot of pressure on these external things or external people to bring us joy, don't we? And it's not terrible. It's just really problematic because people will fail you. You're going to read into a moment with a relationship that you thought was secure and you'll wonder if it's really still secure. And here's what's going to happen. When, they, when you don't feel joy from that person or from that job, you begin to turn inward and there's insecurity there. Why? Because security can't last in a person. They'll fail you. Your security can't even be in yourself because you'll fail you. That's why Jesus is constantly, by his spirit, praying for us. Now, it doesn't mean that these things can't provide joy. Christians don't, we don't just, we're not the only ones that can have joy. It's the supernatural joys, the fruit of the spirit, but it's the combination of all of us. I mean, of all of it. It's the combination of love, when you're hurt, when all this residue rises to the surface. And so here's what happens. The location of the fruit really is in the heart. But the problem is we try to get eternal joy from non-eternal things. So the fruit doesn't come from the outside in. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is from the inside out. I like the way that Proverbs puts it. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says this. It's coming. Boom. Boom. But above all else, it tells us this, guard your heart, why? For everything you do, behavior comes from it. You've seen me draw this before, if not, it was a while ago. Okay, so I talked about the tree, right? And everything you do, the fruit of your life, there it is, an apple, that comes from your heart. Now this will immediately shift parenting or basically every single relationship you have or any leadership capacity you have. It's because if you notice someone's behaving badly, our temptation is just to focus on the fruit. Stop doing that. <laughs> Don't do that. 
And then we can try, but the problem is, is if we tell people to focus on the fruit, what happens is that person's gonna go to themselves. And have you noticed our flesh is pretty weak? Don't go to yourself. What do you do instead? How do we parent instead? Now in a moment, I do need to look at my, my boy and go, perform, be kind. Should he be kind? Yes. But in parenting, it's the long haul. And what I really need to do is open up the heart to why is he not being kind? Why is he not being kind? What's going on in him? Do you see the long haul? And I'm gonna tell you, this isn't just the journey we take with others. This is the journey our heavenly father wants to take with us. He wants to crack open the heart and figure out why in the world are we acting this way? But some of you are going, yeah, okay, okay, so I get it. Okay, so it's the in, out. So if I want to cultivate the fruit, I don't just focus on the fruit. I don't just focus on my behavior. I focus on the heart. I love the way that Sean did this two weeks ago when he poured the water into the member and then all that. We focus on the heart. We actually have to go to the heart. We have to take that drive to want to change and rather than taking it to ourself and our behavior, we have to take it to God. And this happens, by the way, all the time in the middle of the sermon. When you hear that moment and you feel conviction of like, there's the Christian ideal and how you should live and you're like, I should get better because you know really where you're at and you know where you're supposed to be. Our temptation in that moment is to go to ourself. I'm gonna get better at that. But the problem is we're weak. So here's a little, little hint when you're sitting in on that service. Try to be more conscious Conscience, conscious of your conscience. Try to be a little more aware of where you tend to go. Because I think you're similar to me. That we go to the same fleshly residue tendencies that we have. And the term flesh in scripture has lots of different meanings. Sometimes it refers to our literal physical skin, flesh. At other times it references our sinful desires, the flesh. We just war against the spirit, right? We want to do what we don't, we do what we don't want to do because of the flesh. Here's a third definition of flesh that I find really interesting, and it's this, autonomy. What that means is just living by ourselves. And the crazy thing is, it's, we can find ourselves trying to even live the Christian life by ourselves, trying to remember. And that's, by the way, why you feel all that guilt about your spiritual disciplines. It's because you've put it all on you. It's like we're trying to live unaware of the Holy Spirit, and so therefore it's all of our own efforts, so we go to ourself. Or we tend to go to these things to find joy because those are things that we feel like we can tr control all by ourselves. The Holy Spirit's doing a new work. But I also have to say this, because some of you are going, I feel like I've been like, investing in the Lord, abiding, I've been attending church, I've been spending time in quiet time. I just don't feel him. Thankfully, ancients long ago did this thing where they looked at developmental spirituality. So the education system is amazing at this. They look at like development, right? And how we develop, how we grow. This, by the way, is the thing I'm most excited to tell you. So pay attention. If you're falling asleep, wake up. I see you. I won't point to you, but there is someone. <laughs> Listen to this. The ancients looked at the Christian life and they said, how do we actually grow? How do we actually cultivate fruit? How does this process actually happen? And it's shocking. Basically what they found is every believer goes through these kind of cycles. Now here's the cycle. Basically when you become to Christ, when you become a new believer, this moment in your life, here's what happens. You kind of start to feel God's presence, right? Hey, you're reading your Bible. You're like, oh, I kind of get it. Whoa, because I'm in the book of John. And so I'm going and then suddenly what happens is you kind of feel it and then you're worshiping, you're attending church, you're doing things that before this day would not have made sense to you. You're kind, you're loving, you're doing all these amazing things. You feel God's nearness. But then what they found is that over time, there kind of becomes this little like plateau. Now here's where it gets shocking. After time, you actually start to feel something different. Now this, what this is representing is the felt experience of God, not the presence of God. The presence of God doesn't leave once you come to faith in Jesus. Now, the felt presence and the people who were studying Christian lives, they were shocked by this. They're like, wait, wait, wait. Wouldn't you think that the more spiritually mature you are, the more you feel God? Can I tell you, if you're listening in going, that's me, it's me too. So this wasn't actually as shocking. This was relieving for me. Wait, so are you telling me that this is okay? But God, where are you? And they were finding this, that people who had been following Jesus for years and years were asking these questions, but these 16-year-olds at camp weren't asking. 
Let's say that kid comes to Saving Faith at 14 and they go to Christian camp and not only they're excited, they're reading their Bibles, they're putting their arms around each other in worship and they feel so close to God at camp. And then over time, it begins to plateau. The surprise in all of this is that both, and the ancients gave language to this, they said this right here is something called consolation. So I'll put the letter C, consolation. It's the felt presence of God. And then they gave language to this one and they called it desolation with a D, desolation. They said that's like the felt absence of God. And they had shocking learnings from this study. Not only that we go in these types of waves, but that God's actually leading that dance. And I'm surprised by this. What? Why wouldn't God want me to feel close to him? What in the world is he doing? And the problem is, and maybe this has been true to your experience, because you learn in this moment that if I read my Bible, I feel closer. If I praise God and worship, I feel closer. If I really mean it in that one course, I feel closer. If I serve, I feel closer. But the problem is, you kept doing all those things and then it didn't work, so you started to feel guilty about your faith. And then you just tried a little bit harder for a season, right? Okay, if I just read my Bible, if I just commit a little bit more, but why don't I feel anything? Where is he? Is this this ringing true for anyone? And some of you have given up a long time ago and you've just settled for a faith of dry bones. You just settled for it. Like, okay, I must not be good at this and everybody else is. And you watch everyone else worshiping and you're going, they feel something. You watch the students and you're just envious. And you're wondering, am I just not spiritually mature? No. There's a gift in both the seasons. Why? The gift of consolation is encouragement. Why? Because if you come to faith at 14, at 13, you want to know where you found all your encouragement? Sports, academics, people pleasing, people liking you, you being funny, right? That's where they found all that spiritual good feelings, those good vibes. And guess what God's doing with consolation? He's giving you a gift so that you might find it somewhere else. That you could actually find that feeling from quiet time. Because as a 14-year-old, that doesn't make any sense. He wants you to feel those good experiences and feel the nearness. He gives us this gift. Ancients referred to it as like a spiritual bottle of pleasure. And so you read your Bible and you're like, feels so good. (laughs) And then what God does over time is he says, it's time to grow up. And here's what he does. The gift of desolation is that he removes the bottle because he knows that what you need is not a feeling of God. What you need is God himself. What you need is not to pursue something for what you get. You need to look at your heart because in consolation, in that encouragement, you're getting spiritual pleasure, but you're getting it far before your character development. You wanna know why? Because at 15 years old, I couldn't look at my selfishness like I can today. So what is God doing? Where's the gift of desolation? Guys, this blew my mind. What he's doing is he's actually uncovering this heart. Because honestly, if it's just consolation all the time, you know what I'm never gonna do? Look at the actual areas that he wants to grow me. And so what you do in this season called desolation, spiritual disciplines suddenly become a a mirror to what's really going on inside of you. Gosh, I'm really selfish. So I wonder if some of you are going, why am I not more kind? Why am I more selfish than ever? I want to say this. God might actually be maturing you because suddenly you become aware of it. Now the question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to take it to yourself and just try to be kind? Or are you going to take it to the one that wants to cultivate it all? Who, by the way, already knows it all. He's been praying for it all. The gift of desolation is him cracking open your heart and suddenly you see the pain residue of that one interaction you had with that one kid when you were younger that still has pain. At 15, he didn't want to, get, he didn't want to do that with you. He knew you couldn't handle it. But you know what you can now? He's trusting you enough to actually be able to see yourself. Why? Because his goal for us is not our comfort. His goal for us is Christ-likeness. And guess what we have to look at over time? All the ways that we're not. The gift of consolation is encouragement far before your character development. If you wonder, God, where are you? What he might be doing is drawing you nearer and he's using your weakness. 
This, by the way, makes sense of when Paul talks about, remember when he got taken up to the third heaven? If not, Corinthians, check it out. He gets this wild experience. He's like, I'm not even gonna talk about that. It doesn't really do much for anybody else. For me to stand up here and go, let me tell you how close I felt to God during worship. Let me tell you. You guys would be like, okay, cool. Good for you. He goes, but rather, you know what I'm gonna talk about? The thorn in my flesh. The thing that brings me to my utter weakness because when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a gift in both. There are times God seems close, and here's what I can tell you, spiritual feelings, the feeling of the fruit does not correlate with your spiritual maturity. And it is not a result of your actions, it's more a gift of God according to his purposes, but the problem is we thought our own growth was on us. And I'm here to tell you, he who began a good work in you, he will complete it. But we just may not like his methods. So can I tell you this? Let your spiritual disciplines lead you to your greatest place of joy, which is his presence. Remember, in his presence, Psalms. It says this in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. In you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy. Where? In your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. He gives, but he also removes the bottle so that we might grow up and actually be transformed by his spirit, that joy might come out, not just during worship, but when it makes the least sense to the world. That's what he's doing. It's kind of like the difference between romance and marriage. Does this resonate? We're dating, we're dating, we're dating, we're dating. It was a rough date, see ya, but the problem is then you get married and then we're and then we go on a date and then there's a rough run and he's not going anywhere. <laughs> or you wake up and there she is. <laughs> and guess what happens in marriage? You see more of yourself, don't you? Over time. Relationship with God works the same way, and I'm just gonna tell you this. If you're seeing more of your mess in this series, if you're seeing more of your mistakes, if you're seeing more of the pain, he's growing you. That's part of the plan. And he who began that work will complete it. So where is it? It's in the heart. It may not be the journey we want, but it's a purposeful journey. He's bringing you into the reality of what's actually in your heart, all the residue and all the places he's been praying for you to be transformed. So where is it? It's in the heart. Now, what is it? Let's look specifically briefly at joy. Briefly, really briefly, joy is the deep abiding sense of gladness and contentment from God's promises in his presence. That deep abiding sense of gladness and contentment from his promises and presence. It's not dependent upon external circumstances, but the fruit of joy is rooted in God's loving presence and promises. I remember hearing joy once being compared to a buoy in the water. It could be pushed down, bloop, <laughs> that's joy. It's in the water, but it's not sunk. Struck down, but not destroyed. So I'll tell you this, it's not the absence of trouble. It was Elizabeth Elliot, missionary who went through it, who said this, joy is not the absence of trouble but the presence of God. Joy is that deep contentment, the sense of gladness from God's promises and his presence. Because no matter where you're at, he promises his presence. Even if we don't feel the feelings of it, he hasn't left. So let every season lead you to his presence, not to yourself. Joy, where is it? It's in the heart. In, out, not out, in. What is it? Deep, abiding gladness and contentment from God's promises and his presence. So how can we cultivate it? Very simply, how can we overflow? We can't control it. We can't control the spirit. In John chapter three, Jesus literally says, you don't know where it's coming, you don't know where it's going. You can't control it. You're not the boss. But what can we do? First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 Rejoice. Paul writes, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
rejoice. Now you've heard this, you've also heard me say, wait, 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 it's from the inside out. Yeah, you're saying to rejoice, which isn't that like a behavior? Good. Fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy and the scripture commands us to rejoice. How in the world can those two things coexist? The command to rejoice is not a demand for insincere display of happiness, but an exhortation for you to go in, open your heart to God's promises and presence. When he says to rejoice, he's not saying pretend to be happy. He's saying go into the heart and remember God's promises and presence there, no matter what season you're in. Rejoice. Open your heart to God. Rejoice always. Pray continually. As you open up your heart to God, be honest. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you Trust in him. How do you trust in him? Here's how. You get honest with him. You can honestly tell him anything. God, I haven't felt you. God, I'm mad. God, the pain from that one moment of childhood that I'm trying to block out, you keep bringing up. God, I don't even want to pray. Tell him. Do you want to know how he fills us with his presence? Through honest prayer, as we open up our honest heart, the place we need to be reminded of his presence, his power, and his purposes. Honest prayer, and lastly, gratitude. Rejoice always, pray continually, be grateful in all circumstances. I had a friend of mine, Erica, who recently told me, did you know you can't be anxious and grateful at the same time? Think about it. It's impossible. That's why God commands it. You can't be both. And here's what you can be confident of, and then I'll end with a story. You can be confident of this. In Romans 8, 28, we can know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And thankfully, he goes on in verse 29 to define what he means by good that he's gonna do with all these things in our life. 29 says this, for those God foreknew, he also predestined, here it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. Listen to this. The Spirit has predestined you who are in Christ. If you've given your life over to Jesus, you are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's his goal for you, not your comfort. The goal of all of these things in your life is not your comfort or our cultural definition of good, comfortable, easy, successful. His definition of good is that he would use all of these things and all of these seasons to form you more into the likeness of Jesus. And who is Jesus? Love, joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Open your heart to it. My friend Jason was on a walk with his dog. And on that walk, another dog came out of nowhere and attacked that dog. He jumped in front of that dog and in the process broke his knee badly. Goes to have surgery, has the surgery, but unfortunately the blood clots were not detected. So when he goes back because of the secondary problem, they try a surgery to remove the blood clots. It doesn't work. He's now taken into the ICU. They try the surgery again. This time it works. He finds himself weeks later in a wheelchair being rolled by his wife to the same area that the accident happened. And he decided to do exactly what we're talking about. He got honest. And he looked at the Lord and he said, I had these three thoughts. Two, I believe, were from me and the third one wasn't. And here was my two thoughts. First, God, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to walk. I don't know if this is like, I don't know if the blood, I don't know if they got all the blood clots. I just don't know. Second thought, I can't do anything about it. He goes, and it was in that moment, there was this third thought that was deposited right into my heart, a verse I had known my whole life, but in light of the context had surprised me. I don't know what's gonna happen. I can't control anything. I'm not the boss, number three. And my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this was what Jason texted me at the conclusion when I was telling him I wanted to share the story. He said this. (laughs) 
I think part of what was so staggering about this experience is how experiential awareness of God's grace, his promise of grace, his presence amidst it, somehow answered or met or neutralized my utter sense of helplessness. I didn't, it didn't make those things go away. The circumstances hadn't changed. I still didn't have the knowledge or certainty I wanted, but I was still powerless to fix the situation, but I was deeply and fundamentally okay. I was secure and I was cared for right in the midst of my helplessness. This is a reminder to me that God won't spare us from suffering or tragedy, but that he will be present to us in it and that's what really matters most. Joy is the deep abiding sense of gladness and contentment because we can hang out at the place of God's promised presence forever and ever and the church said, Amen. So Father, I pray that right now as we open up our hearts, our pains, our awareness of your presence, I pray that you would deposit truth as we get honest with you. As we go in and be reminded of your presence, as we open up our heart to truly what's going on in there, teach us how to be honest right now. Would we just be honest? Rejoice always, God, in your present and your promises are true. We're okay. As we open up our heart and pray continually. We thank you for never going anywhere. And all God's children said, amen.